According to the Bible, death is wages. God has paid you in death for your sins. It's like a judge in a court of law has a heinous criminal before him, and he says, you've raped three women and murdered them. I'm paying you in the death sentence. You've earned this. This is your wages. This is what you deserve. And God considers sin to be so serious. He's given us the death sentence. The soul that sins it shall die. The wages of sin is death. You're on death row, Matt. Every beat of your heart is a drumbeat of your own funeral march. And it's evidence that what God says is true. And after death, the judgment. Now, let me see if I can bring some coagulation to what I'm trying to say. So we're all born with the earned death, something our parents are both responsible for, not us. We've earned death at birth, while we're also criminals for being born, something that nobody has any control over because two people who were the actual creations of God disobeyed him long before any of us in the world were even born. This is the beyond psychotic idea that this all-powerful being came up with in his plan for us. Matt, imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you had a little bit of a pain under your arm and, and it got worse during the day and you went to the doctor and says, Doc, there's this pain under my arm and it, it started to really hurt. And the doctor looks worried and he goes away and does some tests, comes back and he said, oh, man, I'm sorry, this is lymph node cancer, it's metastasis. Besides, you're going to be dead in two weeks, there's nothing we can do for you. I'm going to give you some painkillers, they're going to take away the pain slightly, but you're going to be dead in two weeks. So you go home. And you lie on your bed, you're not interested in atheism, you're not interested in sex, partying, booze, having a good time, you're so nauseated by the drugs, the side effects. All you can think of is in two weeks, you're going to be put in a hole in the ground. And you're saying, I wonder if there is a way to find everlasting life. And this isn't some weird scenario. Where did the cancer come from? If God created it, doesn't that make God malicious? If God has nothing to do with cancer, why look to God then? Why is death necessary for eternal life? Because we have all earned inherent death through inherent guilt? Because God wants obedience and created two people to fuck up and become the scapegoat for God to hide behind? Cancer is not man's doing either, so the concept of free will doesn't apply to cancer. This means cancer can't be chalked down to being our fault, while our ungodly actions are what Christianity says causes everything bad in this world, and to be our fault. I'll add that I was previously unaware that the wages of sin means we've earned death at birth, which we've earned by being born, which is criminal by Christianity's standards because Adam and Eve disobeyed God, nothing anybody actually did because we don't conceive ourselves. This is extremely morbid and grotesque shit, which you Christians all want to be true. Over 600,000 Americans will die of cancer in the next year. So have you come up with an answer? Well, I have. Christ died for our sins, rose again on the third day. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And this is the reason the gospel makes no sense to someone who's proud of heart someone who won't acknowledge their sins. If you No, it doesn't make any sense. Guilt comes from the guilty person actually doing something, not from other people doing something. What also doesn't make sense is a being that possesses power, being corrupt and psychotic to the extremity of creating life to obey that being. The desire to be obeyed is an ineptitude. The only aspect of it all that actually does make sense is you people worshipping God. I say that because you know there's nothing you can do about being mortal, and you can't handle that. On the freeway, and I suddenly stopped you and said, Hey, man, someone's paid a fine for the law that you broke. You'd probably say, that doesn't make sense. I haven't broken any law. What are you talking about? I don't know. What are you saying? I'm a lawbreaker? The good news of a fine being paid for you will be foolishness. It won't make sense. But if I take the time to say the area you just drove through at 75 miles an hour was set aside for a blind children's convention, 15 miles an hour was the maximum speed. There were signs everywhere. You're in big trouble. You'll go in jail for a long time. Or you've got this massive fine that someone's paid it. 
Now, because you realize how serious your transgression is, the fine being paid for you is not foolishness. Would God need any laws if he simply got over his pathetic desire for obedience or just didn't create life? If even an all-powerful and superior being can't create life how that being wants that life? Of course, tyranny is the opposite of superior. There are reasons behind crime, meaning there are reasons people commit them. Not only is another party paying for a crime, a form of corruption, but not caring about the reasons why the crime was committed is irresponsible. It makes sense, and it's exactly the same with the gospel. If someone's proud and self-righteous, they don't see sin as being serious, the gospel will make no sense. Christ paying the fine for, I don't need that, I'm not a sinner. But once you realize how serious sin is, that it's... Would we be born with sin if either God didn't want to be obeyed or simply didn't create Adam and Eve? No? Then how does the gospel make sense? Aside from that, how does God not either giving Adam and Eve a fair trial or even a second chance make sense? How does putting a tree in Adam and Eve's presence while knowing all make sense? I know God set them up, but you Christians will never agree with that. How does God punishing them, affecting us, making us responsible for seeking God's forgiveness make sense? Especially when birth is nobody's choice. Overall, this isn't even a matter of the gospel making sense, but why you agree with all of it. it gives you the death sentence. That God's wrath abides on you, an enemy of God in your mind through wicked works. Once you acknowledge that with a good and honest heart, you've got a humble heart, then the good news of the gospel makes sense. It's the best news you could ever hope to hear, that God can grant you everlasting life, not as a spook on a cloud playing a rusty harp for eternity, but God says you can have everlasting life. I'll prove it to you. I'll prove myself to you. All you've got to do is give up the fight, stop the rebellion, repent, and trust. God is the one rebelling, as are you Christians, against sin. Not believing sin exists, or simply not believing sin is an offense, is not rebellion, simply disagreement. Not being able to discuss matters with either God or you people is also not rebellion, but dangerously stubborn of you people and God, if God exists, of course. You are preaching Christianity, which puts us atheists in self-defense. I'm the Savior. And God promises he'll reveal himself to you, even if you're an atheist. It's happened to many atheists, happened to me. And Matt, it's my deepest prayer that you consider what I've said today. We don't want God to reveal himself to us. You people want us to want God to reveal himself to us. I wouldn't turn to God, even if he did. We have free will, and for you Christians to preach is to blaspheme that free will. We have a God-given right to live for ourselves. So that, that's it. Matt, you're the straw man king. That was amazing. I could write a book on everything you said there. But let's just pick up some of the things you said. Uh, one of them is that God didn't give any signs about the speed. Yes, he did. He's given you a conscience. He's written it with a, a pen of a diamond on your heart. Conscience. You obviously believe that God's way is good and merciful and all that shit. But I think God has no conscience as he tortures people who don't seek his forgiveness, which you would naturally disagree with me about. Therefore, straw man or not, you can't really claim that God has, whatever you said there, something of, something of a diamond. I couldn't make that out. Because you believe that, and we do not. And as Matt will soon point out here, you can't prove that God did that. This is so powerful it drives many men to drink and some to suicide. How do, you, how do you show that God gave me a conscience? Yes, sir. It's society shaped, but it's God given. How do you, how do you know that? How can you show that? You, well, you can sit here all day long and tell me that my conscience is God given, but also my conscience does not clue me into the same things being wrong that yours does. That's exactly right. The Bible says you sear your conscience as with a hot iron. You know what seared steak is? Just on the outside, it's cooked, but on the inside, it's soft and tender if you cut it with a knife. If we cut your conscience with a knife today, the knife of God's law, would find out that it's written on your heart. You know it's wrong to steal, don't you? Um, I know that it's wrong to steal, but not because of a conscience or because it's written on my heart. You know it's wrong to lie, don't you? 
I don't know that it's always wrong to lie. I know that it There are reasons why people steal and lie, Ray. A concept that God has no understanding of, yet I and possibly other people know. Putting those social ailments into a box and labeling it sin with the expectancy of just seeking forgiveness for it is both empty and irresponsible and causes problems of its own.